So which hall is that behind you? That's from my hometown, which yeah. is actually in Kaohsiung. People know Taipei better, but now my hometown has the largest arts complex in the world oh, wow. since November tw tw uh, 2018. So I'm proud to always say, you know, this this is my hometown. It, it was um, uh, the largest arts complex in the world, having four uh, venues. Um, base out of an old military base. So this is um, pretty exciting until the pandemic pe yeah. pretty much prevented all the foreign groups coming to, to Taiwan. But, but you know, Berlin Phil, Vienna Phil, they have already been there. Everybody is trying to, it's one of the best halls in Asia. It has the, as you can see, the vineyard design of uh, Disney Hall. Mm -hmm. But I think the acoustic is even better than the Disney. <laughs> Just between us. So it, it's amazing to be there. Yeah, it's a gorgeous hall. Have you conducted there? Yes, many times now. Yeah. And and believe it or not, Taiwan's concert life has resumed almost, okay. I would say, 90%. I mean, other than foreign artists probably have a hard time coming uh, to Taiwan with the 21-day quarantine. Yeah. But hey, things are happening. Concert life is resuming. Audiences are back. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's awesome news. We just recorded a concert on on Wednesday. We still showed it digitally, but it was it was nice to get back into the hall for a couple hours. Yeah, that's right. Perfect. And so you you live in in Chicago? Is that is that right? I'm based in Chicago. Based in Chicago. I, I really okay. want to say live. I'm on the road so much. <laughs> yeah. Even even the pandemic, I was able to make it into Austria to do a couple of filming. Okay. I'm principal guest with the um, the Stiriates Recreation Orchestra Graz. And so, yeah, so I, you know, I, I guess conduct about 22 orchestras a year on average, besides my Chicago Sinfonietta duties. And so mm -hmm. I'm on the road a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, maybe it's a good problem to have, at least. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, and the pandemic definitely has made it complicated, but you know, we'll yeah. see. We'll see if, I mean, most of my European um, engagements are still going ahead in the spring. We'll see mm -hmm. what happens then. Yeah, well, it, it's awesome that you're getting to perform and you're, and you're getting to do stuff. Yeah. Is Chicago Sinfonietta getting doing anything right now? I know it's it's really tough for American orchestras. Uh, we have postponed our uh, MLK program mm -hmm. until March. You know, it's just, I think everybody feels safer yeah. because this is just a, a tricky time. I mean, our, we have to be protective of our musicians, Absolutely. you know, in terms of their comfort, their safety concern. And so we're doing, you know, a lot of things virtually, you know, pulling, um, past footage, but also recording just, you know, something new uh, in terms of just m more individually than, mm. you know, ensemble wise. Yeah, yeah. Until March. Mm -hmm. And so you're music director of Chicago Sinfonietta. How long have you been there? Since 2011, 2011. I think. Yes. Yeah. And did I read that you're only the second music director? That's correct. Yeah, wow. because Maestro Paul Freeman founded Chicago Sinfonietta in 1987. And oh. So it's, yeah, it's... Fantastic. Also, have we started? We have started. Yeah, just kind of. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> so yeah. Ma Maestro Paul Freeman founded Chicago Sinfonietta in 1987 mm -hmm. after his chance encounter with Dr. King Oh. At Atlanta Airport, uh, Maestro Freeman was there to to conduct the Atlanta Symphony, and he was actually the first African American conductor to do so. And so, um, he was so inspired from his meeting with Dr. King. He met him earlier, um, and Dr. King remembered him, and that second encounter really inspired Maestro Freeman to found the most diverse orchestra in the country and he thought the best city to do it was in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I've, I've heard a great diversity of programming as well and we can we can definitely come back to programming. But um, and then he, he founded the the project inclusion project uh, just a couple of years before you got there. Is that right? 
That's right. He yeah. started uh, with the instrumentalist. Mm -hmm. And when I came in, um, I thought, why not expand it to include conductors? And so from 2013, we started to launch um, the conducting portion of it. And, you know, you have interview uh, Roderick Cox, um, mm -hmm. and he was one of our first a conducting fellow uh, that we experimenting, <laughs> um, it, including, and he has had great success. Yeah. And uh, Samir Patel, uh, yeah. who was with San Diego Symphony and is now at various posts, and also Roger Kalia. Um, we're so proud of these, you know, first class fellows uh, really going places, but not only them, uh, we have graduated. Um, I would say close to uh, 10 young conductors of diverse background in professional positions. Um, mm -hmm. and it's really exciting for us to see that these conductors of color making their ways into professional career, um, professional conducting field, both in America and in Europe as well. Absolutely. And um, do the fellows, do they live in Chicago? Do they come in a couple of weeks? How does that, how does that work? Um, it depends. Um, if they happen to be local, I mean, we, we, we of course, uh, basically review the footage, um, not necessarily based off their locality. And so we just basically look at where they are career-wise, uh, for example, we have a current fellow who is a student at Northwestern. He just happened to be in town. Um, he also came out of the orchestra as an instrumentalist. And so um, he happened to be in town doesn't mean that, you know, we only choose our fellows in in town. And we, we have had, you know, uh, for example, I mean, Roderick was really, um, uh, I think he was all over. This is this was before he landed the Minnesota um, assistantship. Um, so he was out of town. Samir Patel also, Roderick, uh, Roger Kalia also. So we, we basically um, take people where they are. If they happen to be out of town, we fly them in for wow. a couple of weeks uh, per season to really go through our intensive sequences, which includes, you know, a lot more what people don't get as, as uh, music school. So for example, we worked on personal narrative, um, basically, you know, preparing you for an elevator speech ranging from two minutes to 20 minutes, you know, okay. sitting down with board members, uh, potentially in a music director search or, um, a guest conductor uh, search for later in their lives. And not only that, we include, for example, marketing, programming for various um, uh, duties. You know, uh, one of the things I started as a young conductor is, I don't know how to program for YPCs. I don't even know what YPCs were. Young People's Concert, Family yeah. Series, a park series. I mean, all these incredible, important community programs. I had to learn sort of, you know, crash and burn yeah. <laughs> from having the real position. And so it, it's really interesting in terms of we try to give, give these young conductors, equip them with skills that we believe they will need to succeed in their first professional position. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's very extensive. It's it's really understanding all aspects of a professional um, orchestra, from fundraising, from working with board, uh, understanding who who is artistic administrators at various orchestras, um, just everything you can think of. Uh, and this year, being the pandemic, we have given them video projects to focus on that they could really put on their website to be um, to have an important presence uh, online, as many people have to really go through things online these days. Mm -hmm. I think that's great that they're getting 
that that mentorship and that and that learning for all those things because you're you're right i think most people do just crash and burn when when they get their first job but but then also you can only learn it on the job and sometimes it's hard to get a job without that experience you know not just conducting experience but but everything else yeah so i try to give them what i know from being three assistant positions um on my, uh, on my own journey to really you know, pass the baton, so to speak, you know, and also I've learned so much from my many mentors, um, assisting Robert Spano and Donald Rodnickles from Atlanta Symphony, and my wonderful mentor of the Taki Fellowship, Marin Alzip, um, really knowing the challenges specifically for women conductors, for example, and to overcome that. And, and it's really just passing what we know to help the next generation of young conductors. Absolutely. So what is the what is the conductor part of the of the fellowship look like? Is is there much like actual podium time or actual and conductor training? Yes. So we try to give um, our fellows and our auditors um, what we call quality podium time in terms of that we may be on, on a regular base, each time they come in, they will have podium time with our string quartet mm-hmm. uh, made up of repertoire that's really preparing them for auditions, uh, upcoming auditions for assistantship. And when um, we have created assistantship after the fellowship to really then lengthen the mm-hmm. time they can have uh, with our organization and with me. And so when they are in the assistant position, we try to give them real podium time with Chicago Sinfonietta um, that's um, permissioned from the musicians to be taped so they could really submit the video uh, at important venues like Symphony Center. We perform at the home of the Chicago Symphony. And so it's a really big deal for a young conductor being able to have quality video that they can submit Mm -hmm. uh, when applying for jobs and workshops and competitions down the road. And sometimes it's hard to get that quality video recorded. (laughs) Absolutely. You are absolutely right. You know, to have the quality sound combined with the video, that's a big challenge for many young conductors already. You know, you don't want to submit a video and that's, you know, the brass you know, sort of bla- blasting out the whole thing and you can't quite hear the whole balance or you hear someone, you know, um, the back of the orchestra is not necessarily the best sound um, mm-hmm. representing the collective sound. And so for us to really be able to culminating um, at, at a graduation sort of opportunity is, is what we love to be able to give to our um, fellows. Not all of them get to have this graduation opportunity just because we have so few programs in a season, but you know, the ones that do get it uh, will benefit so much. Absolutely. And so I forgot to mention today we are, we're raising money for the, for the conducting specific Persian um, you know, project inclusion as, as a lot of other sections, but, um, but since this is a conducting podcast, we're focusing on the conducting one who, who should apply for this fellowship. I think this program is ideally suited for those who have gotten um, really great training at music school or conservatories, um, whether that is, you know, finishing uh, a graduate degree. Uh, I would, I would, I would think that is actually probably more competitive just because we have had larger pool of applicants. Um, definitely, um, definitely, if if people are only graduating from undergrad, I mean, we will probably consider uh, those candidates as auditors because it, it takes a little while to really catch up to the curriculum, the intensive c- curriculum that we have designed. And so people who are really ready for having a professional career. Um, that's that's who we are built for. And that's, 
um, the incredible success we have had in terms of really helping the person who is lacking opportunities to be to be ready for opportunities coming their way. We can't guarantee opportunities because you know a lot of the auditions come from uh, professional orchestras and they have their own uh, reviewing process. So we can only pitch our best in terms of, hey, you got to be looking at, you know, these guys. And people do approach us in terms of recommending oh, yeah. conductors. And so we try to do the matchmaking uh, <laughs> as much as we can. Um, but I, I think people who are ready for the professional step and, and finding themselves really hard to break into the field, uh, yet they have gotten all the trainings and experiences there is to get. We're perfect for you. And so I will say, you know, for people who are struggling young conductors, I was one uh, for many years. We are the perfect ste stepping stone for um, helping you to, to, to usher you into the, the real world of professional conducting. Perfect. And what are some of the things you're you're looking for specifically for those for those applicants? We're looking for obviously, you know, for me, number one is can you conduct? <laughs> <laughs> My first process when I look at all the applicants, I don't look at their names, I don't look at their materials, mm -hmm. I just look at their videos. Period. That's all I base on, um, and I I will try to see. We, we don't usually get finished products and we don't want to only have finished products. I want to see talents. I want to see potential. Mm -hmm. Now, not, not to say that's the only part because my counterpart at the Sinfonietta, they look at more of the full package, meaning can you really have a vision for yourself? Can you engage when you speak about, I mean, we do ask people to submit a uh, video where they speak about themselves. And so we're really looking at people who have an idea about who they want to be. Uh, not to say that we're, you know, we're, we're the program that actually designed to help you find, fine tune who you want to be and your artistic vision. And so we, we like I said, we don't, we don't necessarily look for people who have it all, but we are definitely looking at people who know how to engage even through the videos, because if the person doesn't come off um, engaging or, or fun, then, you know, it's a long way. We can't make a person from scratch, if you know what I mean, but we can take a person an unfinished product and make it very polished, ready for the professional world. And so it, it's really sort of abstract. You got yeah. to come with goods. <laughs> That's <laughs> all I'm saying. You got to come with talent and your vision, your passion, maybe that's the word. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you win us over, then we know how to help you because we have very limited resources. You know, we, we're very, small, but a mighty small um, ensemble that, that's very visible um, for the field in the country. And so, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have gigantic, you know, resources. So we have to be very picky about who we choose because at certain level, it's going to be very personal. Mm -hmm. uh, when it gets close to audition times, it's basically me getting on the phone uh, with the with the fellows one on one uh, for a couple couple sessions to really get that person ready for everything I could give that person ready uh, in terms of is very specific things that people look for in an audition. You know, for example, I'll just you know since a lot of conductors are tuning in, um, um, I may have to copyright this phrase, but you know. I was wondering why all the young conductors have trouble with how to speak in an audition setting, in a professional orchestra setting, period. Mm -hmm. And so I developed the phrase rehearsal language. 
That's basically if you have to imagine yourself as English as a second language, like I was. Basically, few words to the point. That's how you speak to a professional orchestra.、Mm-hmm. They are not looking for someone who is flowery with the words. They turn off right away because、mm-hmm. they're not there to hear your lecture. I mean, they probably have played the pieces more than you have ever conducted. <laughs> Um, in in terms of a lot of young conductors conducting in the audition setting, and so we have to we have to practice over and over how to master that. What, what you know, it's it's what I call the pyramid. You're hearing, for example, my first time conducting Oregon Symphony as a young conductor、um, trying to win the assistant audition, and you know they sounded already like a recording. What, what do you say? What do you pick to say? And and if it, you know Atlanta Symphony, for example, they Robert Spano、uh, spoke to us before the auditions. There were I think six candidates, and he basically specifically asked us to pace our auditions to cover the repertoire that's needed to to be covered, and he wanted to see how we use our time. And so I think it's super important in terms of if you were to stop and say one thing to this, you know, 15 minutes that makes and break your career. And this is a, a, you know, Atlanta Symphony. I grew up with their professional recordings. What do you say? I mean, this is very interesting、uh, experience, and almost you're not taught at school how to overcome many challenges and anxieties you feel at professional. Auditions because you are both sorts, both sides of a sword. Meaning the 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 orchestra is is picking a young talent. They know that, but at the same time, they are looking for inspiration from the podium. So if you are on the podium with a professional orchestra for the first time, you have to disguise your fear. And you're trembling, and you cannot let any blood to be seen. Otherwise, the orchestras will be like wolves、um, mm-hmm. over you. You know, it, it, it sounds terrible, but that's actually how it goes. And so, you have to have such confidence from the preparation that you know how to handle such a great instrument without putting yourself. Um, without minimizing your your leadership,、mm-hmm. and and so it's it's a it's a very I think that's probably the hardest thing for us to help the young conductors is、yeah. is is how do we help each one develop such confidence and and experience even though they haven't had such experience and yet you have to bring that with you in order to win the audition. And so that that I think was was what I feel the most proud of that we were able to do with each one、uh, going through our program.、Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, conducting's hard. <laughs> well, and conducting professional <laughs> orchestras is extremely difficult、uh, in terms of psychological、mm-hmm. game. I mean, it's not just about the physical, but there's also the psychological. Part that that is also a huge part of winning an audition. So it sounds like that confidence, I mean, comes from thorough knowledge of the score and and you know really knowing what you're going to do, and then、um, just being professional in the or in the in the rehearsal. You you mentioned using you know very simple words, keeping everything short and sweet, being really effective with your time,、um, and so it sounds it sounds like just you know be prepared. And then be effective with your time, and unfortunately, the confidence is is another step.、Uh, but yeah. <laughs> well, let me add to the to the hard part. It sounds simple, but it really、yeah. isn't, because I think when people think about prepare, so you know, for those young conductors out there, and you also mentioned、uh, the Malco competition that I have、mm-hmm. won, and I'm going to serve as a jury member. So here is another one. Do you know your score well enough? So in that fifteen minutes of competition auditions situation, that you can stop and be immediately know the measure number, 
or A before letter A. In terms of that's the spot you're going to next without like, okay, I have to look for it. I mean, when you have 15 minutes to impress, you almost have to memorize everything in terms of, I know exactly where I'm going to. I'm not going to waste any second um, of doing it logistical thing because mm -hmm. every second you can should be about making art. And so another complication about, it sounds simple, being prepared, saying few words, but one of the hard, hardest thing I cannot really teach over here, over a video is the ability to listen. Listen to what the group is giving you. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, I have done shares out with the Chicago Symphony subscription um, all over in Europe, in, in Taiwan, and the latest with my orchestra in Graz. And I can tell you, yes, I come I, the ballpark of my interpretations stays pretty much the same in terms of tempo, pacing, transitions. But I can tell you, every one of them is a different recording because of the orchestra that you're working with. They come with their own personality, their own preference to tempo. I mean, especially the concert master solo. Mm -hmm. It just will be different. And so the ability to be not nervous about, I got to have the tempo I want to have. The ability to be able to hear and say, hmm, interesting. How can I mold this into what I think will be best between me and the group? And so it takes a lot of chamber music ability. And, and that only comes from making music with others, literally in a chamber music setting. Yeah. Now, also, Another tricky part is, uh, so I'm just going to 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 go into different directions. Yeah. Being prepared for some of the young conductors out there. Well, this might be shocking to you that sometimes you show up and your edition is different from uh, the, what the orchestra is using. And then you find yourself, you can't stop because where is letter A? They don't have a letter A. They have one. And so uh, the preparation, I would totally recommend finding a way to contact li the librarian. The librarian network is so close. Please don't burn any bridge if you can <laughs> help it because it will be broadcasted the next day. And so uh, keep a perfect record of the librarian and be nice about asking, you know, I asked for a PDF of the first violin part. It, you may not need the whole string parts unless you really want to. That's an extra step for people. But having the first violin can inform you so much about the bowings the concert master has done. You can definitely check the rehearsal numbers, letters, measure numbers, in case there's any addition uh, differences. And that's a very important step about not making yourself look like a fool at that first rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Um couple of things I think um, different from this is watching other people's work. Now you have a lot of YouTubes available to you. If you can sit in, well, now it's the COVID time. Unfortunately, it's not possible. If you can sit in people's rehearsals, um, you know, majority of um, assistance time is also sitting in being a cover for a guest conductor or the music director. And people think those times are boring, but I, I spent five years covering for three orchestras and I found myself very occupied. Even though I was sitting in the hall, just listening for balance, I am always ready for the next balance spot. If Mr. Spano turns around and said, man, any balance issue, Boom, I can, I can be ready to say, let her be what wins, maybe softer or something like that. Because you want to be engaging yourself in terms of, yes, I'm sitting in the hall, but any moment you could be called onto the podium, things could happen on, on stage, who knows what, right? And so um, here's an example. Um, Mr. Spano and Atlanta Symphony was, was doing 
uh, I think a Brahms piano concerto with uh, Brothman, and I I I've always uh, you know just be very looking out to what's happening on stage, and even even when the piece has started, and I saw Robert turn around, and I don't know what was happening, whether he needs something from off stage it just looked unusual mm -hmm. so i didn't know what was happening i ran backstage immediately and and the stage uh, manager happened to be i think watching football since you know things have started and i got i got his attention and i said can you please come on stage i don't know what's happening well it turned out the piano's wheels were not locked properly uh -oh. And so the piano kept moving, and then he, I, I think the soloist was trying to signal to Robert, the conductor, I, I can't keep playing because, you know, it's just running away from me. And so, you know, so my point is, as an assistant, you have to be so alert for any important uh, things happening and always be prepared because things might happen mm -hmm. and that you might end up taking over the podium, and so not only knowing your music well, but knowing, I I have notes from almost everyone I have covered mm -hmm. in terms of, in that score, what they rehearsed, what they went to, to address issues. And, you know, when I was in Portland, having the dual heads of being assistant to Oregon Symphony, music director of Portland Youth Philharmonic, I realized the piece comes with similar problems. It's just a matter of degrees. With youth orchestra, it's magnified, you know, yeah. the, the transition is going to be messy. But I realize with professional orchestra, well, the problematic places are similar. Hmm. They're just the degree, maybe smaller, but the, the problem, you know, every score comes with uh, its own challenge and they're similar. And so I would encourage all the young conductors out there please don't ever feel like you know everything. I still don't, I still feel like there are things I don't know about Scheherazade. Every time I do it, I'm like, why didn't I think of that last time? And so I will say, listen to all recordings. Mm -hmm. Bad recordings is also very <laughs> informative. What was bad about it and what was the problematic place that is very apparent on the recording and they didn't have time to fix. That was very interesting. And so I will say we have all the tools available to us. And so, you know, being prepared as a young conductor, it's it's not easy because it it, it encompasses so much that you need to be ready for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I in rehearsals, I'm always taking as many notes as I can. Like I'm like, oh, if I have to if I stop, am I missing something? Like, I try to always be busy and, you know, yeah, absolutely focusing on, on the sections that get rehearsed and the yeah. sections that don't, because sometimes it's it's not what you expect. But I love that. Just always be prepared because, yeah, at, at any moment they could turn around. And um, and the more prepared we are, the more we can actually help. You know, I think we feel so helpless, so helpless as assistants all the time. We don't get to do anything, but we really can if we take notes and we send notes and we and we help with those things. And I will also encourage people, if you have the chance to sit in rehearsals, to listen to what needs to be done without, what needs to be done that has to be spoken about. Yeah. Or things that will naturally fix itself without you touching it. And so this is, this is another sort of comes with experience. And, and a, 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 a very common mistake uh, I think a young conductor does is you hear something, you stop immediately and you try to demand it versus, okay, maybe maybe take take this passage one more time, but, but you do have to say something. I mean, if you don't say something, then the orchestra thing you can't hear. So it's a balance of giving them a musical direction and letting things sort of find itself to be fixed. And this, you know, it, it's it's a hard one to discern. Mm -hmm. Now, um, another 
thing I will encourage all the connectors listening, I, I will assume more American connectors listening than European connectors because I, now I work in both continents. It's a huge difference yeah. in terms of rehearsal expectation. In awesome. America, things are need to be efficient because it's very cut, cut and dry and do not ever go over one second mm -hmm. because that will not go down well for, again, the personnel managers, they all talk, which young conductor went over time without, you know, um, without realizing it. And so uh, another really important thing I will encourage American young conductors to do when you stop, it's easy to fix the obvious, the technical, longer, shorter, louder, softer. But please don't forget why we're there. We're there for the music. This is what European conductors do more. Hmm. Is they focus on the music and then use the technique to support it. And so I, I always train my, uh, the, our fellows when you have eight words, I try to limit their one sentence to eight or 10 words, because in an audition setting, really that's all, all they have the t tolerance for. How do you get in musical? Well, obviously you have to say where it is, who is involved, those are, those are given, right? Then what you really need to cover is musical intent followed by a technical help. Mm. Okay. All that in 10 words. <laughs> and it takes quite a bit of practice. It's really yeah. not, not second nature. Mm -hmm. It's easier to just keep talking and keep talking. Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, there will, there will be a moment, for example, if you are auditioning for an assistant that has, for example, a youth orchestra attached to that job. Well, then you rehearse differently with the youth orchestra. Mm -hmm. With the youth orchestra, you are more of a teacher. And yes, I, I still think the, the efficient way of rehearsing applies. However, you do have to give a little bit more soul and spirit to the piece for the young for the youngsters. You know, it's, it's the cut and dry doesn't necessarily go far. You have to create at least one magical moment as my conducting father um, Mr. Ken Kiesler at University of Michigan has, has taught me, you have to create at least one magical moment in a youth orchestra rehearsal setting. Yeah. And that could be, that moment could be, for example, I have done crazy things with my youth orchestra um, uh, time. For example, I asked them to stand and dance that passage. <laughs> That could be a, you know, it's really breaking out of their shell, feeling a music. Mm -hmm. Or I, you know, in Taiwan, the summer festival, now, now I lead has a youth orchestra program. I have basically taught everybody basic conducting patterns. So everybody has to conduct, conduct mm -hmm. and sing. That's how you can master sort of the, the musical intent you're trying to create. Uh, with your instrument and so a, a magical moment could be storytelling mm -hmm. you know really sort of put people's mind in in terms of a story i mean this moment could be you know a sun rising on a cold winter night you know just just giving images and so i think it depends on the situation i think you know the professional orchestra is less less likely to 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 share with your enthusiasm in storytelling but the youth orchestra definitely mm. that's that's a different different way of communicating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so let's talk about some of your teachers you mentioned um ken kiesler and you've you've talked about robert spano a couple times who are all your teachers and then um a couple of lessons that have really stuck with you you know um i, I would just pull from various teachers that I have so many to, to be <laughs> thankful for. You know, uh, I, I had a wonderful violin teacher, um, Eric Rosenblith, and I, I was doing sort of 
I was doing double master's degree at NEC, which was like the first person to have done it in both conducting a violin. So I was practicing maybe three and a half days and then doing conducting in the other half of the week. And I will come into my violin lesson and, and he will say, well, man, I know, I know you're very busy and you learned this very quickly, but you're, what are you trying to say with your music? Oh. Yeah. And I think that has always stuck with me, even as a conductor. What are you trying to say with this passage, with this Dvorak, with this Beethoven? You know, obviously, we, don't, we can't call them up and ask them directly, but we have to come up with our own interpretation. So I've always, that has always stayed with me. And um, my dear first violin teacher um, who was so tolerant of teaching me English, Mary Lou Speaker Churchill, who was the longtime second violin um, of the Boston Symphony. I mean, it's interesting how we all come to a problematic spot. I mean, in rehearsal, as a conductor too, you know the orchestra is struggling, you know you have to get that transition. and our first instinct is always just do it over, over, you know, sort of the drill master yeah. in us. And I will always remember Mary Lou saying, man, love it more. Hmm. When it's difficult, you got to love it more. And yeah. so it's really approaching it a different way. And so I have I've used really fun examples um, in rehearsals. Uh, some of my orchestras uh, always laugh at me when I say as sharp as sushi knife, you know, I will always rehearse the ending, you know, don't just take it for granted, but to get the the, the sound is really crisp uh, sounding in that hole. Hmm. I, I use fun uh, examples like that. Then there are other, you know, incredible mentors. Uh, Mr. B, uh, Frank Battisti, who is very important in, uh, win ensemble literature and was literally my first conducting teacher. Mm-hmm. His approach to rehearsal, respect for the players that have always stuck with me. I mean, he will have rehearsal written out from, you know, for example, 9.30 to 9.43. That's on the first piece. <laughs> I mean, he is, is just such an organizer. And yeah. so that I have found that really helpful when I have one rehearsal to put together a young person's pro, a, a young person uh, concert program, really be able to stay on top of my timing. Uh, I have wonderful mentor in Marin Alsep, who has done so much for women conductors. Uh, that I don't know another person on the planet has done more than she has. And Marin is just a wonderful inspiration in terms of, she inspired me to really work on public speaking. Just be able to talk about the music you championed and to be creative. I mean, she's so creative with, incredible ideas, just anything, you know, when she started the Baltimore tenure that she invited, um, she created opportunities for the people who built a hall to come and be part of, you know, the celebration. I mean, how creative is that, you know, to really include people that's outside of your normal base. Uh, Ronald Donnacle, uh, 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 Donald Ronicles, um, excuse me, Donald Ronicles with the Atlanta Symphony, who conducts the orchestra, almost imagining you have lungs on your arms. <laughs> I mean, the singers love working with Donald because he understands yeah. when the phrases needs to breathe. And, and, you know, he conducts with left hand was, you know, very curious for me to see. And, you know, he actually puts the orchestra in certain mindset. Huh. And, and I find a very interesting way um, of, of rehearsing the orchestra, much more European. 
Um, and so it, it's uh, all my, I, I learned so much from all these mentors, it, it, each one of them, you know, Robert Spano has created the theater of a concert concept with Atlanta Symphony. For those of you who don't know about this, just Google Atlanta Symphony, for example, Haydn um, creation. You know, I had to cue the broken triangles, which were, were also parts of the screens. Um, but but it's just incredible things that they were able to create. Doctor Atomic, for example, mm -hmm. uh, theater of a concert, really, cre really bringing uh, extra theatrical elements into your concert production. I learned it from Robert um, more than anybody else. It's just incredible to be able to think outside your box um, and and to make your art form more relevant to more people. Some people are very visual, like my sister, who is a visual artist, always think coming into a concert hall, sitting down for two hours is kind of boring experience. And so I think the theater of a concert is totally like, you know, her thing. So so I will encourage all the young conductors to think outside the box. Yes, of course, know your Beethoven, know your Tchaikovsky, you know, uh, which is which is very a lot of repertoire, standard repertoire. You got to know it at the back of your hand. You have yeah. to know better than five. Oh yeah, uh, so well that you know that it will make or break your career. <laughs> However, there's so many conductors conducting those standard repertoire. Mm -hmm. before that. Yeah. What stand? What can stand you apart from others? Could be the repertoire that's unique to you. So champion, champion conductors that is unknown, that is contemporary, that is composers of color, uh, woman composers, anything that, that, you know, you have to find it, what, what your heart is passionate. I can't tell you what you like. Uh, you have to find it and, and find a niche of creating something that's unique. So what what repertoire do you champion? How do you how do you program your concerts? So at Chicago Sinfonietta uh, was always well known for not only championing for diversity, uh, equity and inclusion, but also very innovative programmings because they play in the same hall hmm. as the Chicago Symphony. So you might remember, I remember as a young conductor thinking, which crazy orchestra is this? 2006 on the front page of New York Times for the, uh, the art section, there was a, a, a orchestra that commissioned a concertino for cell phone and orchestra. Um, uh, Call a concertino, yeah, concertino for cell phone and orchestra. And this is before cell phone became household items. And I kept, I, I remember thinking to myself, whoa, that orchestra is pretty brave. <laughs> Not knowing years later, I will be at the helm of this orchestra creating crazy programs. <laughs> um, and so um, because Symphonietas has always done things outside the box, if you thought it, we probably have done it. So, you know, um, and, and I'm, I'm ha happy to share, um, maybe I'll send you a link that you can uh, share with, with your listeners, um, sort of a, a, a minute of our crazy projects um, during my tenure. Uh, for example, uh, a world-class tap dancer mm -hmm. dancing to Firebird Suite by Stephen <laughs> jumping off the stage at the end of, you know, his, his portion. Huh. Um, we have done live pen painting to uh, live music. We have done unusual instruments. Uh, we have done uh, various type of dance uh, with standard repertoire. I mean, you name it, we we'll probably uh -huh. have done. And so it's uh, the Sinfonietta's programming, you can say it's fun, but also super challenging because yeah. everyone has to be sort of its own narrative uh, and it has to jump off the page like a Sinfonietta concert. So, for example, um, we did a collaboration with Muka Paza, a 30 piece mismatch marching band in Chicago that has a huge following. I lost two nights of sleep trying to program with, with them. 
I almost quit my job over because I'm a classically trained conductor. What, what do I do with a, a marching band in a concert hall? So I'm proud to say we come up with a, a pro- project that has won us the MacArthur Genius oh, Grant. Wow, yeah. um, uh, we became the first orchestra to have won that. Um, we created a concert version, the first half uh, taking music that's connected to bands you know, such as uh, English Folk Song Suite yeah. by Bon Williams, uh, Britain, Young Person's Guy setting up, you know, each section battle of the band's idea. Second half, we take the band's music and made, made orchestra uh, arrangement. Mm-hmm. And my dream come true when I was sitting in Chicago Symphony's uh, performance, I was dreaming about how could we make the concert experience more theatrical. And so my dream came true. 15 member of the band sign up to to be lifted up in the piano lift as we started the music and people were like we hear the band but where are they and when people see the susafo coming coming out of the piano lift it was like a rock concert it was not a classical concert anymore then we did the second piece of their music had a klezmer feel to it so i link it to one of the most well-known symphony that has klezmer music, Mahler Symphony Number no. One. Da 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 dum da dum da 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 yup da Right, and so you know the uh, when we met with Muka Pazza, they said, "Man, we have cheerleaders." <laughs> and you can imagine my my face. What do I do with the cheerleaders? So they came out and did a cheer leading into Mahler one. It was the most entertaining. <laughs> then the uh, final piece, 1812 by Tchaikovsky. Mm-hmm. So Muka Paza orchestrated their entrance uh, from various uh, entrance in the hall as the invading French uh, <laughs> and the orchestra as the Russia protecting its motherland. And so at, at one point, they even had uh, cheerleaders coming out on um, the choir love holding baguettes. You know, they ran out of food and and lost the battle. At the very end of the piece, Muka Paza literally died on stage. Uh, The orchestra was the victor uh, of the battle. And so my musicians were so fun. After the first performance, they came to me and said, man, could we march out as the victors after the... Uh, uh, after the Muka Pata band, I said, of course, feel free. And so we had also purchased 11, uh, 11 shots of uh, confetti cannons. So we have no split session, ses- sections in, in, in orchestra hall. And we, we saved two shots aiming for the right angle and then um, 11 shots, you know, for the performance. And um, it, it was it was to die for that moment of audience gra- trying to grab onto those long confetti and with the lighting. Uh, it was it, you have to you have to see it to believe it. And my wonderful team have come up with Battle of the Beers for before the concert, during intermission, and after the concert. You know, if we get them drunk, they're more likely to to (laughs) get the orchestra. And so anyway, so that's an example of Chicago Sinfoniata's crazy programming. Now, what I have found that's really interesting that has become sort of a part of trademark for my career is championing for women composers. Mm -hmm. We have created Project W as um, a way to celebrate our 30th anniversary because the the baton passing concert when Maestro Freeman passed his baton to me was a program all by women composers. So we take that one step further of honoring, you know, his uh, legacy and to really create a disc with our wonderful partner, SETI Records, mm-hmm. uh, to capture five works by women composers um, among the nine total works that we feature over the season. We were, by percentage, we were number one in the country 
By number, we were only number two after Los Angeles Philharmonic. <laughs> we have ten works out of their two hundred some works. Yeah. We have nine out of twenty-two. You know,、mm-hmm. and so it was a big year for us to champion for women composers. Project W. We feature the first African American. A woman whose work being premiered by a major orchestra,、uh, whose name is Florence Beatrice Price,、mm-hmm. uh, who was originally from Little Rock, Arkansas, and made her home in Chicago uh, uh, from 1927 all the way until the end of her her life in the 50s, and、um, she. Won the Chicago Symphonies competition, and when they premiere her symphony in E minor in in thirty three, she became the first African American woman in the、mm-hmm. country whose work was、uh, received such a big exposure. And so, we have on the disc project W、uh, of her charming dances in the Cambrics because、mm-hmm. I think it's easier for orchestra. Who doesn't know her to program short pieces as a, a way to introduce her to the audience, and this is orchestrated by her childhood friend, William Grant Still, who is much well known,、uh, yeah. the dean of African American composers. They were both from Little Rock, Arkansas. But you know,、uh, when Florence Price, at the end of her life, this is 1953, when she wrote these three dances using indigenous African rhythms for piano, I think she was too ill to orchestrate herself. She's a wonderful orchestrator,、um, you know, as you can hear from her Mississippi Suite and her symphonies. But she asked William Grant Still to orchestrate for her. So,、uh, so that's on our Project W as you know the first. Captured、um, dances in the Cambrics that almost nobody else has programmed, but I have championed it all over. Even brought it、yeah. to Sweden and and Austria. Now we also have、uh, a Clarice Assad,、um, the daughter of the Assad brothers, and Clarice literally. Study in Chicago, went away to New York, other places. Grew up in South America as as well,、uh, but now is, has called Chicago home, and so、um, her wonderful、uh, work written for us was really pulling. And all her, I think all her works is pulling from her to Americas. You know, her South、mm-hmm. America, North America,、yeah. musical、uh, influences,、mm-hmm. and Jessie Montgomery. Uh, really,、um, if you don't know her name, you should because almost every orchestra is trying to program something by her、uh, since the Black Lives Movement,、uh, Black Lives Matter movement takes off.、Mm-hmm. Jessie Montgomery was from、um, New York and really able to bring to her music this, I think, just wonderful、um, fusion of all kinds of music. Really exposed to her in New York growing up,、um, Lower East Side, I think, and and really be able to use her string background.、Um, she is a very accomplished violinist、uh, of the Catalyst Quartet, and so you know her、uh, piece of Strum written for strings, also Starburst, is literally hitting the orchestra radar. You can. You know, Google Starpers, and you will see a Minnesota recent、um, uh, streaming online、uh, through Facebook on her piece of Starburst.、Mm-hmm. Really wonderful,、um, very rhythmic, and and very creative mind of Jessie Montgomery. Also on the disc, very well known Je- Jennifer Higdon,、mm-hmm. a, a a dear friend I got to know from my tenure in Lenha Symphony.、Um, I assist. I assisted her、uh, in the recording with Jenny Coe,、uh, the singing room with Atlanta Symphony and Atlanta Symphony Chorus.、Uh, we recorded her dance card because that was.、Um, it was. We were just lucky to be able to catch the Coe commission since I also did. Uh, the Houston premiere with River Oak Chamber Orchestra, and the dance car for strings is just five individual wonderful movements that can be created in any combination、uh, of the suite or individual movements. And、uh, I think it's some of Jennifer's best work in terms of just、uh, the sublime beauty of the slow movements、um, and the wonderful rhythmic driving.、Um, 
fast movements. Um, I highly recommend people, especially in this COVID time, if you need to do something smaller, uh, like reduced version, strings only, Jennifer's Dance Car is it uh, for, for a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I would like to mention, yes, uh, one more, uh, one more wonderful composers uh, from Project W before I mention the ones that didn't make it on Project W. Uh, Rina Esmel, who, is, uh, who grew, up, grew up in Los Angeles and now still also based in uh, Los Angeles. Wonderful composer in terms of the first in able to being able to fuse his uh, Hindu uh, Hindu uh, or traditional Indian music with Western music. Um, so it, it's uh, the piece she wrote for us was to, it was right when Me Too movement was really uh, at its peak, and she was writing something else that she uh, uh, approached us and said, is that okay that she changed the title to Me Too? And we said, by all means. Mm-hmm. And it's this wonderful um, raga that she also sung on the disc that made it into us the materials for her Me Too for us. And um, I find her music incredibly exotic and and interesting because it puts me in a different world uh you have to be able to cross over um to this you know uh raga and and tala this is very different world you know Mm -hmm. this is all oral tradition it's not written down and in terms of you know their uh, you ha- it's it's a different world in terms of you know their pitch sometimes is bending because there are three there are three uh, portions to a pitch and you have to sort of hit it just right and it, it's completely different than what we think of Western music and so I love Rina's music anytime you know I premiere her uh, Tim Morty also for strings. Mm-hmm. And the musicians find it incredibly challenging and fun because the the mix meter is harder than Rite of Spring. <laughs> <laughs> I can only explain. I mean, I, I I literally show her score to the audience uh, when we did it in Chicago. It was just it was just uh, kind of a, a different experience for us. Now, one more woman composer for young conductors out there. I've discovered um, a wonderful woman composer who's just literally forgotten in history. Mm. The first symphonic composer for Croatia. Her name is Dora Pejacevic. Let me spell for you. Dora Pejacevic. P-E-J-A-C-E-V-I-C. Now, she lived very short lives, but, you know, she lived in a very interesting time. When, when her music, you can hear a glimpse of Bruckner, huh. um, of Strauss, of, you know, the tone poem, definitely so evident in terms of, you know, um, I believe she studied with the same teacher as Strauss. And, huh. you know, in her um, F-sharp minor symphony and F-sharp minor, she even um, asked for augmented brass, almost like Wagnerian. I mean, who does like, you know, five horns and and, and four trumpets, you know? Uh, no, I'm wrong. I think it's like six, four, six <laughs> horns, four trumpets, even larger than the previous movements. And yeah. so, you know, this is really fun. If you want to dive into things you don't know, it, it's, it's, it's really, really wonderful composer. Um, she died actually of um, giving a year after giving birth to her son, and so it's really unfortunate that we don't have any, you know, more more works from her. But but she was already very prolific. Another unknown composer I highly recommend the young composers as I have championed um, some of his work. Joachim Raff, R A F F. Contemporary of Brahms, yeah. a Swiss-German 
um, composer that was really sort of a, a, um, a prodigy of Liszt. Um, and she had, uh, well, and he has created sort of the, the Four Seasons Symphony, Symphony number A to 11. I've done the summer and, and you just have to, you just have to listen to it because I think it's just hidden gems. Um, it, you know, it, it's not Brahms, but but it's you can tell it's the same period. Yeah. And it, it has wonderful sparkling quality to it. He was very w- one of the most well-known German composers when he died, but now has been sort of forgotten. I've, mm-hmm. I've literally have to bring it back to... The repertoire in, in, in Austria, in my orchestra in Austria, they were surprised that I brought them sort of their own composers that they have forgotten. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. He did a, um overture on Ein Festeberg, right? I, I think so, I yes. Think so, yeah, we, I, yeah, I did that with a with a, like a with the Mendelssohn Reformation Symphony so I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with that. Amelia, yeah. well, go for yeah, you, great. go for you, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Another composer I've fallen in love, and I, I've just, I've just, it, it's, it, it sort of saved me from my pandemic anxiety is Piazzolla. Mm-hmm. I've just been digging into Piazzolla's um, The Tango Opera. It just, it's just incredible. It makes me forget uh, about all the troubles in the world. And so I highly recommend if you don't know Piazzolla, I mean, there's not a whole lot of orchestra mm. works he has done, but there's definitely arrangements, you know, the one I have enjoyed so much um, is, is with the uh, Royal Concertgebouw, mm. a brass ensemble. They have definitely made an interesting arrangement um, uh, from it. And I'll, I'll just say, you know, Dig into Piazzolla. Yeah. You, you, you might you might love it. Perfect. Well, man, thank you, thank you so much for this chat today. Um, is there any final advice you'd like to send everybody off with? You know, I would just like to say, being a conductor at this time, particularly, you got to love what you do. Yeah. Meaning, you got to love being a champion for the art form in every way and sometimes being unusual ways of being thinking outside the box and being online and finding interesting way to create your own ensembles um, in this very challenging COVID time. But also your passion will um, take you far because I think uh, you got to want it so bad. So, So many young conductors come to us and we try to say, look, you have the talent to make it. You got to trust us. Um, but they didn't believe it at first. And so find an angel in your life that that believes in you, like many of my mentors did, you know, uh, for for Robert Spano to say to me, man, you got to come to Atlanta because, you know, America needs your kind of conductor. I mean, I was in tears. Find your angel that believes your gifts and then really hold on to that through up and down times because I can promise you there will be down times more than up times. And you will wonder, am I in the right journey? And I can assure you, if you don't have enough passion and have enough angels in your life, (laughs) that you won't be able to pull through all the down loops that we will experience. But if you are passionate enough and really find a way to create opportunities. You know, I also have to, with 14 engagements cancel out of 22, as I told you, my yearly average, I I also have to find other ways. You know, I created um, without knowing, um, without even knowing how to do PowerPoint, I actually create a two hour curriculum uh, teaching conducting patterns, following symphonic dances, um, uh, uh, a passage for mixed meter, how to do four against three, and and even you know other fun uh, trivial questions 
all in one presentation, and I have used it at several co colleges, the Brown University, USC, University of Houston. And so five ways to create things. That's Well, I have to thank uh, Carnegie's NYO2 because I literally created for the students who could not meet in person. And so that, that led me to explore creating this program. And, and I'm going to create another one to follow this up. And so I encourage all of you out there to think outside the box and, and you are not alone in terms of we're all going through this together. But if you can, you know, use your energy to create something unique, um, you will survive and thrive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for for leading Chicago Sinfonietta with these fantastic programs and this and the great um, project inclusion. Um, again, we're raising money for that today. So, uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me and thank you for inviting Chicago Sinfonietta and, and for raising funds for our Project Inclusion Freeman Fellowship. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Absolutely.